Hello, Vinya. Hello, Tirana. So I want to tell you a people story that connects me with you and everything that we're experiencing at the moment in the world. And the story starts in my childhood, obviously. My mother always says that I was like this. Why, why, why? I was an inquisitive child. Why are there more poor people on the roads? Why are some countries richer than others? Why are we solving this problem like this? Is there not a smarter way of doing it? Now I have kids by my own, and one of them especially has such an inquisitive mind. About two months ago, which was the birthday of my three children, they all born in the same week, and the little one, who is seven, he was sitting there, and as he was blowing out the candle, I was thinking, how is his future going to look like? And my inquisitive mind brought me to a whole soul search in the last 10 years. I went international from my home country, I interviewed people. I had a tough time with myself. Sometimes didn't want to get out of bed because I couldn't figure out the meaning and what it meant to me and what my life and my position in life was. And I read this book by this Australian nurse and she's also sketching out what do people really think about at the end of their lives. And these people normally, we would assume, are not lying. And it comes down in my inquisitions, in my research, I came down to four things that really matter in life. You know, taking away economic realities, you have to work, yes, true. You want to love and be in relationships, all of this. But what really, really matters, what you can't debate away, are connection, community, sharing, collaboration. When I think about the future of, that I want to give to my children and they should have, I'm also thinking about the beautiful landscapes. And I was lucky enough to see such a beautiful landscape when I traveled to Greenland. It's the second biggest ice cap of the world, a huge fridge. And I was hanging there out with some locals, and they are telling the stories when you're sitting in the front of the ice that they're very proud of, that are terrific. They say, Harold, you are here now at the ground zero of climate change. You can see firsthand here, when the ice is melting, what climate change is doing. They also described how it sounds to them what the ice is doing. They said the ice is crying, Harold. The ice is crying. Because it makes funny sounds when the air disappears and comes through the cracks when the ice is melting. And they say there are 10,000 rivers now flowing from the ice into the ocean. And these were many, many, many less a couple of years ago. And I was thinking there, oh, this is not the future. At the birthday of uh, my kids uh, that I told you about, it was also my son's first birthday. And this our designer put on this sheet together because he thought it's such a beautiful contradiction. This guy is born in his first birthday, and in the same week, in the same week, I'm reading an article about Japanese scientists that found at the deepest bottom of the ocean in the Mariana Trench. And here you see on the picture, the oceans are spilled. There are more plastic in the next 12 years than fish. Everybody knows this, or many people are talking about it over dinner. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a colleague of mine who is working a lot in Brazil. And Brazil and the Amazon is considered something like the lungs of our planet. It filters out a lot of the dirt that is going out in our atmosphere. And then he told me something I didn't know and was really, really shocking. I hadn't thought about it. He said, listen, if this is continuing for four to five more years, only four to five more years, this ecosystem that is functioning on its own, it's not going to function anymore. It's going to be irreplaceably damaged. And we all know what happens when a living, a living system loses its lung functions. And then we're not talking even about economic and financial problems. The financial crisis 10 years ago happened with a big bang, the whole, uh, the whole world was shaken. But did the system really change? Are we safe now that the same thing doesn't happen again? And when you look at social inequality, that 1% of the world has an accumulated wealth that is bigger than 99%, or is the same as 99% of the rest of the world, 
it's just unbelievable. And when you look at the statistic, yes, it's true that in terms of GDP, of gross domestic products, our richness is increasing. We are doing better. This is a graph that is showing this over the last decades in America. But in terms of development as humans, you are, showing, you are seeing what the red line is showing. We've been going sideways. We have not going up, because this line also takes into consideration not economic issues, but also social and environmental. So we're talking about social inequality. We're talking about environmental problems. We are talking about an economic system that is not fit anymore. This is not a system I see fit for any of you, and also not for my children. I want to talk about this guy, because it's at the heart of everything. At the heart of everything, we have maneuvered ourselves into a linear economy. A linear economy has been driving a lot of the negative consequences we are seeing now. And in the heart of the uh, linear economy is a take, make, and waste economy. And we are very much part of this. And I recently uh, read, that's why I put this guy here, pig. Pig is the new thing. It's the problem of immediate gratification. We want and we want more and we want ever more and more and more. It's a very one-dimensional system. We are getting the resources out of the planet somewhere. We are producing something. We are using it and then we are throwing it away. And this applies to many things, many things of our daily life. The things we wear, the washing machines we use, the phones we use, and the pile on the right here, the red thing, it's incineration. Most of these things are never making it back into a system. But how stupid is this? So we have maneuvered ourselves into the wrong direction. Consumerism was very much at the heart of this. And yes, this linear system has also brought us a lot of wealth for some. It has brought us additional income for some. But overall, it has brought us an incredibly negative, toxic cocktail of negative consequences. It's not a system I want to see for the future. The system I want to see is a circular system. And for this, we need a true systems hack. We need to build the systems hack around things that matter, a meaning economy, about sharing, about community, about connectivity, because this is what matters to us. And in my vision for the future, for our children, a circular system is the way to go because it looks very much what is reality. And reality is that things are systems. It's a very beautiful system. It's taken out of nature. But there are other systems. You are a system, your family is a system, your business is a system, your families. Countries are systems, cities. A city is a classical example of a system. It's not going in a line. There's interaction between the different parts. It's the ecology of things that matters. And the question is now, how can we develop in such a system, a system, an economy that works? And I truly believe that a circular economy has a real opportunity to be such a system that works for our children and that I want to see for mine. Why? Because it looks first at renewable energy. It doesn't look anymore at energies that we are running out of, oil, for example. The whole energy transition is very, very important. And in uh, Holland, where I live at the moment, uh, the public transport system is very good because it's taking part of this. Already, the whole electri electrically uh, driven trains are now run through green energy. That's a huge step forward. I also believe that the circular economy is a system that works for future generations because it's trying to see how we can use things smarter how we can use them longer. And I'll give you a very practical example. We have worked with a, a big company that makes machineries for uh, hospitals. And obviously, in these hospitals, they help people. And so we took the job to try to help them. Don't think in a way that you sell more machines to the world, because this is an old way of thinking. If you want to be relevant in the future, think how you can get more worth out for the people that you're trying to serve. And how do you make this at a better price? So we developed a circular system where they are taking back all their machines into their uh, remanufacturing hub. 
out of this, they're making new machinery. They're not, they're not put somewhere in the landfill. Thirdly, I think a circular economy is a real answer for a future system that we want to see because it looks at designing out waste, at reducing waste, but eliminating waste, hopefully. And the most radical examples that we all or many know is Spotify. Spotify has revolutionized a whole industry. And now when you want to listen to more music, it's not anymore about buying new CDs, buying new CD players, which would be obviously ne uh, negative for the environment and its impact. Now it's about making it available. And the great thing about a circular economy that makes me so passionate about it is it's grounded in entrepreneurial realities. We want to get the best out of human race, innovation, entrepreneurship. We're using technology for solutions that we hadn't thought are possible. And it's about radical collaboration. We started to work with the textile chain, and the textile chain is very problematic in its negative consequences. But we only started to find out solutions when all the guys who were part of the textile supply chain sat in one room. All these different opportunities came up. It was about transparency and radical collaboration. That's a very difficult thing to achieve. And this is not only what is happening in, in cities. It's not only happening in businesses. And here, I just show you on, on one map that we are really trying to have less on the right side. We have less waste. But we're trying to loop back everything into the system. And it's not only happening in businesses. And this is the interesting thing. And why I think this is going to be a real movement, a revolution. Businesses get involved, but it's only cities and governments are getting involved. I moved my family. I lived in Asia before. I, lived, uh, I live now in Holland because the Dutch government said in 2050, in 32 years from now, our country wants to be 100% circular. And I think they have not a great deal of idea how this is going to look like. But the ambition is there, and the whole country started to work. It's incredible. The energy that is there. It's the businesses working together, civil society organizations, the government, local governments. It really gives hope. One city we are working with, um, we found something very simple and something very nice as an example to show. We found out that there's a lot of food waste. And when we look and start to work with the city, and you see this here on this plan, on this map, on this graph, we are mapping out how things flow through a city, because a city is an organism. I told you this before. It's a system. So when you look at then all these things are flowing through the city. And then you have to think, OK, how can we make it smarter? How can we avoid waste? How we can, can make connections? And when you start to think about this, you're getting a very different picture. You're starting to see cycles everywhere. And then one, uh, one party stood up in our meeting and said, there's so much bread wasted. A third of the bread produced every single day is being wasted. And then a beer brewing company said, oh, it's fantastic. We can use all of this. We just make beer from this. And it's an example that is very simple, and there's more complicated ones, but it shows how one part of a system sees something as waste, and a different one would like to pay for it. And now it's hard tech. It's a beer that actually tastes quite good, but it's made from bread, which is a concrete outcome of our work there. And the good thing, it's not only happening in Western Europe or in Europe or in America. There are developing countries, emerging economies coming and say, how can we use this new way of thinking? A circular economy is a true answer here. How you can develop a pathway that is human-centric, that is low carbon based and is innovative. And it's good for the people and the social causes. So when you apply this lens of a circular economy, this way of thinking and systems, you come to a whole ocean, but reality check. When we did a study of the whole world, how circular the world actually is, it's quite depressing. The world economy at the moment is only 9.1% circular, meaning 90 plus percent are never making it back in the system. It's waste. They're landfilled. They are burnt. It's really wasted. But I'm hopeful that this can change. And why? 
because people start to ask the right questions. And that's where it all starts. And they ask me, so what can I personally do? And then I have to be careful because I don't believe that only consumers will change everything. It has to come together with businesses, together with governments, but we have a role to play. And I want to give you an example. I brought it all the way. Carrot. I took a decision for my family that we don't want to buy them anymore in supermarkets. A, I don't trust anymore what is in it. I don't know where it's precisely coming from. A lot of the food we see in supermarkets comes from abroad. And also the taste has been going down its quality, I think. So we, my family, signed up with a cooperative, with a farmer. We're investing in a farmer. And this farmer is producing food, vegetables. So we're an investor in him, and there are several investors. And the interesting thing is, it gives me a say in how he grows the food. He is changing his business model because at the beginning of the year, he knows how much membership money, how much money he is making. He's not dependent anymore at the resource that he gets out of his land at the end of the year. He's in a better position. I'm in a good position because I know how this food is grown. The fantastic thing, I can go with my kids there, we plant the food, we do the whole thing. They actually know how a carrot smells and how it grows. And I know, because we agreed, we don't use artificial fertilizer. We use the bio-waste from the surroundings, and it works. And the nice thing is, and it's a bit an atypical example, I think, but I believe this is what a circular economy can look like. You're building community. My kids hanging out there with elderly people who don't have a job anymore, and they can volunteer. They love it. They love to grow food. People who have time devote their time, and we spend time together on the weekends there. Second example. <laughs> Second example, my mom <laughs> always asks me, what are you wearing? And I never cared, really. I was a guy who uh, yeah, didn't care so much what I wear, it just has to be functional, you know, you go quickly into a shop, shop that is close, you buy several things, you maybe think, okay, size, color, fine. But then when I started to work on circular economy topics, this is not a choice anymore. You can't go and just buy. You need to know what you buy. The textile industry is the second most polluting industry in the world. And I like to see it differently. It's the biggest chance for us to change something, but we need to engage. So I have two examples. I have second-hand shoes, which is very circular. This is good. And I have lease jeans from a company called Mud Jeans from, the, from Holland. What does a lease chain mean? They don't belong to me anymore. I'm a pure, poor man, but it feels very light. It's very good. The company has an interest when they lease the chains, then they bring back the chains when I don't want it anymore, or I want a different one, they are taking it back. Maybe somebody else gets it. At the end of its life, it's shredded. It's put into small pieces. And it's going back into the process that is guarded by this company, and they're making a new chains. A really smart solution. Again, good for me because I have the feeling I contribute in the right way and I'm making good decisions, good for society. And globally, it's a huge topic that we're starting to textile industry. Number three. <laughs> Phones. We all have them in our pockets or somewhere else. And sometimes even the materials, uh, the items we are using to connect to each other can be forces for good. I think this one is a really fantastic example. It's a company called Fairphone. And I always smile because it says actually, the change is in your hands. They started off as an initiative to try to tell people, um, educate people about, do you know where the stuff that is in, in phones, where this is coming from? 
And when you dig deeper, it's always coming from the same countries. And a lot of the materials that are in there are very rare. They're called a rare earth. Tungsten, for example, that is used in a thing that makes the phone vibrate, it comes from conflict-ridden areas. And on the social side, because again, it's a business that is taking its values very serious, they are saying we are trying to change also the value chains. They are trying to go into these countries to find ways on finding fair ways on engaging the uh, co-workers. So real, with just this phone, a real revolution is spreading into all kinds of uh, the value chain. And let me try uh, come to an end now. So I'll give you three examples on how we dress, how we communicate with, our, with each other and what we eat. And these are very much at the core of what needs to change if we want to change this number. Because the world is only 9.1% circular. The global economy is 9.1% circular. And we have to change it. It's a big way ahead. It's not acceptable. But you can also say it's a good challenge. And we're going to take on this challenge. And I'm hopeful because people asking and starting to ask the right questions. And if you have questions, then please Sign up at worldcirculareconomydays.org. We've started to build a global movement. There are many organizations that are starting to, uh, to sign up. It's going to be a movement that brings together people with questions, because none of them are very easy, and we can only solve them together, and people with answers who are trying to do this for a while, because they are out there. It's only about actioning them. If you agree, with the way I describe the circular economy and how the meanings of life around sharing community and connectivity have to come together in a new economic system, then I ask you, please, give us a fighting chance. You, me, our kids, our communities, our cities, our businesses, and our governments, that we make a circular economy a reality. Because many people have been searching for a long time, including me. And I truly, truly believe a circular economy is a key to many of the answers we have been so long trying to achieve. Thank you. <laughs>